Welcome to Viewpoints. Today with us, we have Chief Lillian Bonsignor with New York Fire Department, uh, EMS. Um, Lillian, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Great. It's great to have you here with us. Um, you started your career in 1991. You must have seen so many changes since then. Yeah. Uh, I was about half the size, too, uh, back then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, a downfall of the job, huh? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> um, uh, there's just a, there's a whole variety of things I want to talk to you about. Um, our time on NEMSAC uh, when we were, when we met um, in August, you, you were promoted to chief in May of 2019. And you represented a lot of firsts for the FDNY. Uh, is that fair to say that? Yeah, I think I, I, I've stayed on that track my entire uh, tenure here, too, it seems. But yes, I was a first uh, female EMS operations chief, first female to ever get four stars in the fire department in over 150 years. Um, wow. First openly gay. Uh, and then, of course, COVID. <laughs> oh, COVID. Yes. <laughs> we don't even like to say that word. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Um, you're, you are a beacon of light to so many, uh, your journey to chief starting 30 years ago when you first, uh, um, when you first got into the public safety world, can you tell us a little bit about your journey? Absolutely. My, my journey to chief actually started when I was a kid, I, I was, uh, 14 or so. And I met, um, two really extraordinary women. And it's because of these two women that I even ended up on this path. So one was my pediatrician, believe it or not, she was my doctor. And the other was an educator in my school system. And they didn't know each other, but I happened to meet them around the same time. One, I was a little younger, around 11 or so, but by 14, I knew both of them. And they both, for some very strange reason, I'll never understand, decided to invest in a kid from the Bronx that was broken and needed a little extra help. And they did so independently. And they, each one of them ended up being almost like a mother to me growing up. So, uh, you know, if I wanted to learn about education, I would obviously talk to the educator. And, uh, and then the doctor taught me about medicine and I developed a love for it. So, you know, these two women actually put me on my path. The, the doctor... Um, she's the one that pushed me to EMT school when I was young. I, I went to EMT school in 1989, I believe it was. I, I didn't start working for the city until 91, but I worked a few years before that. So she, you know, she decided, hey, it's time for you to get into medicine. Put your money where your mouth is. Let's go. Because I was working in retail and um, having a hard time. You know, I was a, I was a young mother at that point, uh, which, you know, had not planned to be that way, but it was, it was that way. And she said, now, now is time. Let's go. I'll put, I'll pay for your school if you need me to, but you need to wow. get into medicine. And I did, uh, she didn't pay for it. I, I worked to pay for that schooling. I remember that being so much money. I think it was $400 for my EMT class back then. And $400 was like $4 billion to a a single mother, right. <laughs> a young mother, but I paid for it. And I went to EMT school and, uh, you know, it was the best thing I had ever done. Wow. And that, and that brought you here, uh, yeah. out of retail. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. I was actually the youngest manager in the chain. I don't know if you remember the store. It was, I don't even know if they had it where you are, but it was a store called Lecter's. It was a houseware store back then. And nope, I, was, I have never heard of it. Yeah, it was pretty cool. I, I was the youngest manager in the whole chain. It had like 300 stores or something. So I worked my way up to becoming manager. And then as retail does, you know, it got very difficult and they went in a different direction. <laughs> Let's see. Oh. Uh. Like, <laughs> and at that point, you know, I, I didn't know what I was going to do to support my child and support myself. So this came at a really good time. So, you know, I go to EMT school and, 
and I think, uh, okay, this, this is going to hold me over because I really wanted to become a doctor. So that was my goal. And in school, when I was young, I was always straight A's. So, you know, it wasn't a far reach that I could do it. It's just now all these circumstances are in my way that didn't exist before. Right. So I figured, uh, and Stacy, who was the doctor, tells me, well, do this for a little while. And then we'll figure out how to get you into medical, you know, medical school. Like you need to go to college, you need to do all this stuff. So I said, okay. Um, and it ended up being the longest summer job of my life. Cause now, you know, I'm 31 years into the city and I'm, you know, approaching the end of my career. But I, as soon as I entered EMS, absolutely fell in love with it. it this was exactly where I needed to be. And was perfect for me, my personality, and the things I wanted to do in life. So I, I always say EMS saved my life. Oh, that's very cool. Um, so you've been in leadership. You were in management at your at the retail place, and then you moved up in leadership with uh, FDNY. Also, uh, what kind of leadership challenges? And what solutions have you used uh, throughout the years that, that really, really work for you? Yeah, that's a great, great question. I mean, I guess if we could really drill down on what the answer is, there'd be so many really great leaders out there, right? But leadership is hard. Leadership is very hard. And it takes so many different steps. And I would say the first step that must absolutely be done is a self-reflection as to whether you want to be a leader because it is really about action, not about names or titles or desires. It's about what are you willing to do? Are you willing to serve rather than be served? Because that's really what leadership is. You know, you, you can call yourself a leader, but if nobody's behind you, you're not a leader. So right. <laughs> you know, it really is a self-reflection that has to happen first as to what, what do you have to give? Because my job as a leader is to provide example, is to provide support, is to provide structure, is to provide, you know, direction. But it's mostly to provide potential, right? To unlock the potential yeah. that somebody has inside of them that they may not know exists. Like the potential that was unlocked in me that I didn't know as a young girl existed, but these two women did. They, they saw it, it was in there. And they put me on a path and allowed for me to unlock my own potential. So I, I take this very, very seriously. Um, and I think, you know, my job is to serve those people around me. And by doing so, I allow for them to unlock their own potential. And then I can foster that, and, you know, help people figure out how to really kind of make the most of it. So without self-reflection, uh, without being willing to put other people first, you probably should not be a leader. So I, I think that's number one, right? Like no, number one right. is you got to be willing to do it and do the hard work and, you know, take the criticism that comes along with it and continuously self-reflect. And I do that all the time because I am so far from perfect. That's not even funny, but I commit to being the very best that I can be, you know, with the tools that I have and, the, you know, the, the desire to be better, then I'll be the very best that I can be. If that's the, anywhere near great, then I'll take it. Right. I'm never going right. to be perfect, but it, it is, uh, it is very challenging. And here now I'm in a position and I have worked my way up. I've held pretty much, uh, you know, lots of management level, leadership level positions in the fire department. Um, though I skipped a couple of ranks along the way, I think that's the overachiever in me. Uh, you know, it, it is difficult. I have right now about 4,500 people that report to me wow. and we have, we have a rank structured environment. So certainly, you know, there are different ranks. Uh, I'm the top EMS chief. So I'm the four star, which, you know, means there, there are lieutenants and captains and deputy chiefs and other people between me and everybody else. But I need to get my direction, my ideas, my leadership all the way down to the newest person coming in the door. And that that is difficult to do at best when you're in a rank structure, right? I, I would imagine it's difficult in any structure because the more layers that sit between you and the people executing or actually doing the job, 
uh, makes it that more, much more difficult. But our, our absolute number one asset are the people who do the job. That's so, so I, true. That, right? And don't we forget that sometimes as leaders? Well, you shouldn't, uh, because I really have to agree with you. Without without the people who do the job, your leadership means nothing. That's correct. And I, I wrote I wrote something a little I don't know a few years back. It was called "Leading the Invisible," right? So, and this is how I kind of associate the leadership piece of this: is you know we have all these folks that are out there, literally putting their lives on the line for other people, right? So. We know the character of these people. We know the men and women who will leave their own families to serve and protect somebody else in their family, right? These are first responders. This is just the basics of what first responders do. And, you know, they, they do an amazing job. It's a very difficult situation, particularly for EMS. Nobody's throwing you a party when you show up, right? You're like, they call right. 911 or they call an emergency number and you're showing up at their worst possible time when they're scared and something terrible is happening and, you know, there, yeah. there's no cupcakes and parties happening. Right. So it is a difficult job for an EMS person to do this over and over and over again. And, you know, in a, in a large organization, I would imagine the same thing in small organizations. Um, they don't generally talk with the leadership, right? The EMTs, paramedics, the people who are doing the job from day to day, they really don't interact with the higher levels of leadership unless something goes wrong, <laughs> right? Right. And, and all of a sudden now, the leadership wants to have a conversation with them about the stuff that's going wrong. And and I, I, I say, well, you know, how does that make them feel? And we have to think about this. And I, I always tell the story of my brother, right? My, my, little br my brother, I was the oldest of four kids growing up. And my mom was a single mom. That's a whole nother podcast. But, you know, that's, <laughs> yeah, she was a single mom. So like I, I would bring straight straight A's all the time. And my mom would look at him and go, wow, that's so good. And put it on the fridge. My brother would bring home a C now and again. And we would have an ice cream party. Like it was some magical trick that he pulled off because, you know, it was not uh, it was it was not his reality to bring home good grades. So when he passed something, you know, my mother put a lot of effort and a lot of attention into his success right in that particular moment so what what does that do for me now please don't call a therapist i'm good about this i'm i'm truly okay <laughs> but for me i become invisible right i become invisible because i'm always going to get the a no matter what no matter what she does no matter what she says no matter what policies we put in place it, like the people who do the great job are always going to do the great job and they're invisible the people who have a little struggle and need a little extra help are the people that interact with the leadership the most. So, you know, the, these folks can go years through their career and never really interact with anybody until something right. goes wrong, right? If I were to bring home a D, I'm sure my mother would have a lot to say to me about my grades. But, you know, she, you know we have to make sure that the people who are doing the job get the recognition they deserve because that's where your strength comes from, right? That's where your morale comes from. That's where your desire to keep doing that, right? When somebody says, hey, you're doing a great job and not just, hey, you messed up this one time. So my thought is instead of spending 90% of our time on 10% of the people who really can't get out of their own ways sometimes, flip that around. Spend 90% of your time on the 90% of people who are doing a wonderful job and take the 10% of the people who struggle and help them find their way. And if they don't find their way, then there needs to be this accountability piece. And I think that right. serves both ends, right? So, I mean, as far as leadership goes, I think sometimes we forget that there's so many wonderful things that are going on below our ranks, you know? Because you only see the worst, right? The stuff that gets to you, the higher you are in the, in the hierarchy, it's the stuff that cannot be fixed at the lower levels that get to you. And it's easy for you to take these things and think this is representing everything that's going on. And it, it truly is not. It's just a very small fraction of the stuff that needs your assistance. Everything else has been solved below you. 
And, you know, there's way more good than there is bad that's happening. I, you talked about the people not knowing you, the invisible people. And um, you and I share that leadership philosophy. I, I'm sure you didn't know that. Um, when I was a PSEP director, I would go in like 5, 5.30 every morning so I could see the night shift because otherwise they would never, ever see me. And um, you didn't you tell me that you went around to all of your different um, stations? You didn't call them stations, though. Uh, yeah, no, they're stations. They're my stations. Okay. They're divisions, right? Yeah. Okay. So, yes, you're absolutely right. I agree with you. So I, I do lots of, like unorthodox things, I guess, you know, uh, as far as like interacting with the workforce. So I, I do things like we had town halls. So during the summer, we go out to each division. Now, understanding a little about New York, um, we have five boroughs and most people know that Bronx, Queens, you know, Manhattan, Brooklyn, Staten Island. And each one of those boroughs are split with the exception of Staten Island. They're all split in half. So we have a total of nine divisions we respond to 1.5 million runs a year. So wow. we have, you know, about 40 stations within these nine divisions, within these five boroughs, if that makes any sense. So we, we go out, me and the whole leadership team, and we, we put this out of our pocket. Like we go out to each division and we do what's called a town hall. So we go out, we barbecue for everybody. Like we physically buy the food, cook the food, serve the food you know, and uh, just hang out with them. And then we set up a panel discussion where they can ask me whatever question they want, even the hard ones. And there are lots of hard ones, you know, there, there are lots of hard questions, but you know, it's me giving them the truth. And the truth sometimes is not the answer they want to hear, but it's the truthful answer. So I spend some time with them there. I do, uh, we have our own training academy. So I go to speak to every class uh, when they go into class, whether it be a, a refresher or a new employee class, I'll go in and spend a little time with them and talk to them there. Uh, we were doing uh, things like a uh, unit of the month. So that's, you know, out of each out of each division, they would submit their best unit. And then we would pick one for the month out of the whole city. And we would bring them. This is pre-COVID because we had to, you know, adjust. But we would bring them up to headquarters and we would take them out to lunch. So we would just go to like a neighborhood restaurant. I would, you know, put the money out and take them in a lunch, talk to them about their experience and what they wanted. Wow. And, and they, we would meet the uh, commissioner, the fire commissioner. <clears throat> so that was always, I think, their favorite part. The lunch was my favorite part. <laughs> well, <laughs> you're, you're um, talking about servant leadership at its at its finest. I, I mean, yeah. that's, that's great. I believe in it. Excuse me. Uh, yeah. I, be, I believe in that very, very much. And I believe in, uh, you know, paying, paying forward because I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for somebody taking a chance on me, a couple people taking a chance on me. Um, you were quoted as saying, above all, never mm -hmm. let somebody else tell you what you can and cannot do. So do you remember saying that? I do. Yeah. Okay. Um, that statement was empowered to you, I'm assuming, partially from the positive role models that you talked about in your life. Um, besides your daughters, have you ever had the opportunity to provide that same role model example for other kids like you? Yeah, I, th you know, I young think, yeah, and yeah, I think the answer is yes. And, and, you know, again, something that I take very, very seriously. So just me being in a position I am makes me a role model for most, you know, most women <laughs> uh, coming up in a male oriented fire department. So, you know, I think this is a good thing. But along the way, I've spent some time talking to high school kids. I spent some time uh talking to the, the new employee classes. And I think the message, I'll tell you a funny story too. <clears throat> I think the message is there are so many things that set you up for failure in your life, right? And 
sometimes these things are just there to test your fortitude, to see, to see if you can overcome these challenges. But it's easy to just throw in the towel and say, this is not for me. I, I will tell you that I was um, married at 17. Uh, again, another, another story. Really yeah, just another because, podcast. Yeah. I, I had a child at 18 and I end up having to leave high school, take a GED and, you know, work a job in a re retail to pay a babysitter just to try to survive. And like none of that equals chief of EMS operations <laughs> for the biggest fire department in the country right? Leading right. the largest and busiest EMS system in the country. Not, not, those two things don't go together. So I think the message has to be, there are lots of people who are going to tell you that you just can't do it. You can't do it because you're not those kind of people. You, that doesn't include you. That's too far beyond your means. And the answer is no. The, the answer is you can do anything that you put your mind to but you may have to work a little harder. And, and, right. you know, if you stay the course, if you stay the course and you, you stay committed to your goals, then you will find people along the way who want to help you keep going. And I could, I call those people pivot people. You know, there, there are people in my path who can either take me right or left, you know, uh, mm -hmm. right or wrong. And, all I need to do is recognize them. And sometimes they're there for five minutes. Sometimes they're there for 30 years. But it is, a, it is the gift that they give you that keeps you moving in the right direction. You just have to be willing to do the work. So I'll tell you a quick, funny story. In the fire department, they had started a, a group, you know, for the LGBT community. Now, I'm also the highest ranking out out. LGBT member. So, uh, so they give me an award, right? So here I'm, I'm with the fire department for, you know, 28 years at this point. Uh, I've made some really sustainable like changes and really impacted the direction of how we do business. And I'm getting an award for being gay, which I put zero work into like, right. <laughs> zero work. <laughs> like, uh, so, <laughs> I thought, well, okay, right? That that's very sweet. I of course I accept, and and I know that this is a, a good thing for our department. It creates diversity, but I literally put no work into doing this, and I got an award for it. And then one day I'm walking in a parade, and not because I'm gay, just because that's what I do as a leader. I march in all the big parades in New York City, and I happen to be marching in the Pride Parade, and there was a proby that was behind me, you know, young young girl. And I look back and she's just like, <laughs> you know, like, who she sponsored you are, <laughs> you know, like, you're my hero. And she's a young gay girl as well. And I say, well, come up here and march with me, you know, come up, come on up here and march with me. And at that moment, I realized that award was not for me at all. That that award was for this girl. That award was about possibility, right? Like she now has somebody that she sees and relates to that looks like her has the same lifestyle as her who who is now the chief of EMS so that right. award represented what i provide for those people behind me which is an example and their own possibility and i was so proud of that award as i was marching in this parade with this young girl because i i knew that she could now see it in herself that someday she can dream big and say i'm going to be the chief of EMS and it could happen you know that that's crazy, isn't it? Um, when I when I think about that, while you were talking, I was thinking about uh, all the things you've done in your career. Um, you know, being in charge of training for the biggest uh, EMS operations in the country, and um, when you were promoted to chief, the headline was first female openly gay, and I'm like, what is that? I mean. You had done all these other great things, but that's um that's a really great perspective that you have on 
you know, what that meant to others. Yeah. And I'm okay. I'm really okay with it. And, and, you know, at at like the middle of the night, I wake up and there's some on some obscure like cable channel, there is a round table discussion as to about me being the chief of EMS. And, you know, did I get it because I was gay? Did I get it because I was a woman? Like there was there was nobody that thought I got it because of my merit. Right. So this is just something I think uh, many women in these more male oriented environments. And I don't think it just needs to be first response. I think it could be anywhere. Um, In order to be successful, you almost have to be better than the best man. Right. So, you know, I think I learned to, to say the diversity that I bring is a positive thing. That is a positive thing to the agency. And it's a positive thing to the people in the agency. And it brings a perspective that, you know, is lacking in, in some cases. So, I think it helps us all. And the fact that they chose to capitalize on, you know, I was a woman, I was gay, I was this or that, just makes me happy because that means that some other woman or some other LGBT member or some other person that sees me with a short haircut and thinks, hey, I have a short haircut, (laughs) you know, Uh, they all think they could do it because of that. So I'm okay with it. It doesn't offend me at all. It, it, it doesn't define me, but it's, it's something that I bring that most people don't. So I'm okay with putting it out there for those people who are also out in their world, you know, thinking this is not for me, that this is for those people. No, it's for you. You are those people. Right. Um, well, when you talked about your accomplishments, um, alone, you know, you're the round table that you heard in the middle of the night. So um, let me talk just a, a little bit about uh, September 11th. Uh, when September 11th, uh, 2001, when the attacks occurred, you'd been about 10 years into your career and you were um, a training instructor. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Um, yeah. And then you you were you were having training the day that happened. So you had all those extra people available to respond. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that day? Uh, you call the towers the twins, right? When the, yeah. when they collapsed, you couldn't believe the twins <clears throat> had fallen. Yeah, it was unbelievable. You know, the, the, the twins had stood over us for years and years. They were part of our every day. It was unbelievable to think that they could be knocked to their knees as they were, right? But right. uh, that that particular day was a vet. I, I can remember it like it was yesterday. We were we were at the training academy. I was an instructor, and we heard that a plane had hit the towers. So of course, you know, we all run to the nearest television. Cell phones weren't such a big deal back then, so you couldn't just pull out your cell phone and look at Twitter. It didn't exist, right? Right. So, <clears throat> so you know, we run to the nearest tel. Uh, television to see what's happening. And we all thought it was a small plane, you know, it's, uh, you know, what is Cessnas or, you know, one of these little planes, like two passenger, four passengers. Right. But, but uh, when we saw it was a passenger plane, it was just unbelievable. It knocked the wind out of you. And then shortly after when the second plane hit, we knew that this was not an accident. And, We had several buildings of first responders who were all in refresher training and otherwise at the EMS Academy in Fort Totten in Queens. Um, And we had to muster up now and respond down to the scene. So we uh, commandeered a couple of city buses because there there weren't enough ambulances that are at training. The ambulances are in the field. So uh, we didn't have a way to get everybody down there. So we got a couple of city buses and we had a convoy and end up going down there. As we were on the highway, we saw the first tower fall and the eerie silence of all the people just in the bus uh, going down there was deafening. And by the time we got down there, the bus had put the bus, the convoy had pulled up and the second tower came down. So we were all enveloped, you know, in this uh, dust and debris. 
and again, a very odd, there was a lot of like odd feeling about what's going on. Cause you really could, the magnitude was so great. You couldn't wrap your head around this and you look around and everybody is just gray, right? There's no white, there's no black. It's just, just gray. <clears throat> Everybody's covered in dust. So, you know, my, my group, uh, I was again, an instructor. So our, our group ended up going to what we end up calling the pit, which was where the, the buildings had fallen. And our mission was to become a forward triage. And that's where you would go, uh, triage the people out, you know, into categories and, you know, start preparing them for treatment or transport. And by the time we got down there, we realized there was just nobody to triage that there was nobody there, nobody to triage. Uh, and we converted into a morgue unit <clears throat> and end up, uh, spending many, many hours, you know, trying to identify people and, and, you know, figure out whether they were fire department or not. We lost 343 of our fire department people that day among the thousands others who was, you know, in the building and other agencies. We have now, uh, unfortunately crossed the 300 mark, uh, of post nine 11 illnesses. So we, uh, expect that this year we're going to exceed the number that we lost that day. But that is a day that goes into your brain and, you know, changes you, right? It changed the whole right. world. I'm sure it changed you as well and, and everybody else in our country. Uh, but it, it changes you. And I can tell you that even now, we bring all of our proby classes down there. Now it's all built up and, and there's a, a museum and a reflection pools. And all of our classes go for a visit. And I go personally, I go with them. And, you know, we talk about, that day, because there aren't a lot of people left that remember it, you know, now it's, these kids are now at the age where this was just a story to them. So, you know, we go down here and we talk about, you know, the, the magnitude of the day and the, the heroism and, you know, the commitment to, to saving others. Um, and they, they learn the lesson, but even now, after all these years, I could smell it as though it was the first day. And I know the smell is not there. I know the smell is in my head, but I could smell it as though it's the first day there. So, you know, it's something that sticks with you and, and it changes the way you think. I'll tell you a couple lessons I learned out of that. One, one being the most valuable lesson, which is those people went to work, right? Like we just went to work. You kissed your loved one goodbye or not. You waved, you had breakfast or not. You had coffee, you dropped the kids off at the, you know, daycare or not. You know, whatever your morning routine was. And then you went to work. You didn't expect to not come home. And, right. you know, maybe maybe you fought with your spouse. Maybe they were mad at you because you didn't take the garbage out. Maybe, you know, maybe there's uh, financial concerns in your family and you're not talking to each other. Maybe you didn't want to wake your kids to tell them you loved them. But those people went to work and that was the last memory those, you know, that, that existed for their family members, friends, their loved ones. So I, I tell you, I walk away from that um, thinking, man, these little things that I used to be so concerned about, I could care. I don't care at all about those. Like it, it takes so much to shake me because I stay positive. I think, you know, now after all these years, um, and we lost, you know, so many good people to post 9-11 cancers that, you know, it's kind of like a, our clock is ticking, right? You wake up and you say, today my turn, you know? No? Right. Okay, well, let's have a wonderful day. Like, let's impact somebody in a very positive way because I'm still here today. Let me make sure my family knows they love that I love them. Um, so if I don't come home, uh, we don't leave it weird, right? Yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a tough time. You, um, you shared a little bit about your philosophy, that philosophy right there about not letting the little things bother you. And I think, um, when, when, uh, we were talking back in August and I, that was powerfully impactful for me. I hope our audience, um, really takes that to heart because 
that changed your life, that event. So let's, yeah. you know, I mean, hopefully we wouldn't have to all go through something like that to let your words change us. Right. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I always say, like, if I weren't here, if I was not here tomorrow, would this moment today matter? <laughs> right? Like, that's the judge. Like, if you're fighting about something stupid, if I didn't come home tomorrow, would this moment matter? And if the answer is no, then leave it alone. <laughs> right? Stop fighting. Good things to tell your kids. <laughs> wasting time. Don't worry about it. Right. Uh, um. Well, speaking of, thank you for sharing that, by the yes. way, I, I think it's a really powerful story, um, with a good takeaway. Um, and two months ago you lost a Lieutenant, uh, who probably intended on, you know, going home that day. What kind of an impact you did to a senseless homicide for our viewers who might not be aware of it? What kind of impact did that have on your agency and, and on you? especially, you know, you've gone through 9-11, you've gone through COVID and, and now this. Yeah, it, it's been rough. I mean, I'll tell you, even through COVID, I lost my second in charge, my three-star chief uh, to post 9-11, oh, wow. post 9-11 cancer. And then, you know, we went, <clears throat> we went right back into another COVID surge. So it's been difficult. Uh, who you're referring to is... Uh, Lieutenant Allison Russo, who was an amazing woman and, and a friend, you know, it's, we, we didn't go to each other's house for holidays, but there, there are very few people who have been in this job in EMS in New York city for the amount of time that she was here. She was here, you know, quarter of a decade. So right. we all grew up in the same place. So, and having been at training, I had the opportunity to get to mo know most of the people that were coming in through the system. Um, she was a wonderful, very, very committed uh, woman. And she was preparing to retire. She was a rescue medic, uh, which is our most elite uh, paramedics. They do all the, the special operations, you know, high angle and water rescues and things wow. like that. Yeah, she was very cool. And she was a volunteer in her own community in the, in the ambulance company there, in the first aid squad for over 30 years. So this was a woman who was so committed to just caring for other people and doing this job. It was in her soul. She loved it. And she walks outside of her station in Queens, Astoria, not, not, a, not a neighborhood that we're concerned about. You know, it's a fairly right. uh, safe neighborhood. Um, she's on duty. She walks outside of the station and she gets attacked by somebody uh, and heinously murdered, stabbed multiple times. Um, and she lost her life to that attack. And it was like a shockwave through our system. I don't think it was just our system. I think it was the world, to be honest, the EMS world. Yeah. I got, you know, calls and emails from all over the world offering condolences for, you know, the loss of uh, who ended up being Captain Russo. We, she was uh, promoted after she had passed. So, you know, it was something that really shook us all to our core. The fact that we're in this environment now where you could just easily be standing someplace in a uniform and somebody take your life that without without any kind of trigger, without any kind of argument, without any kind of interaction. So you know it it is scary, and yeah. we, we are in we are in this position now where the people who are doing this job start to think about whether this is all worth it, and that is scary for the country at large. Can you imagine? this world, this country, without people who are willing to show up at your bedside at your worst medical moment. And, you know, I think what, what happens with things like this is you start to really consider whether this is a place you want to be. And, you know, as random as that attack was, and it was random, she was the second 
FDNY EMS woman to be murdered while on duty. In 2017, we lost Yadira Arroyo, who was uh, run over by her own ambulance, somebody who jumped in her ambulance and tried to take her ambulance. So, wow. you know, th th this is, you know, within five years of, of uh, each other. So, you know, it's, it's a very, very tough thing to overcome. And as a leader, <clears throat> and I was at the hospital and, you know, with, with her coworkers and friends and family, it, what words could I possibly offer to try to bring any kind of sense to this? There aren't any. And the truth is we're angry about it. We're angry about what they did to our friend and our coworker. You know, we're angry about what they did to EMS, <laughs> you yeah. know, and a first responder. Like we used to be off limits, right? Like EMS used to be off limits. We were the ones that no matter which side of the equation you were on, we were there to help you. Right. And, you know, it, it, when you see things like this, uh, it's really hard to offer any sense of comfort or peace. And the only thing I could do as a leader is stand with my people and share in their grief and share in their loss and, you know, just rely on each other to try to get through this very difficult situation and to keep Allison's name alive, you know, as we did. Yeah. It was a tough loss. It really is a tough loss. And she never made it to, to retirement. You know, she worked so hard for it. Uh, and that's so tragic. I, and it was so senseless. Um, you know, we, we kind of have talked about, you know, retirement. Um, certainly you didn't get into this job, nor did she. So, oh, I can't wait to retire. I, you know, retirement's on the horizon. Someday I'm going to retire. I mean, we got in it. Uh, uh, anybody who's been in public safety for any length of time, we got in it to serve, you know, to make a difference. Yeah. Yeah, that is true. And here I am, uh, and you and I have had the, the pleasure of discussing retirement, but here I am making the choice to retire uh, and end a 31 year career. And it's probably the hardest decision I've ever had to make. But I understand. You know, I've had such a joy and such an amazing career and the opportunity to meet so many dedicated and wonderful first responders and particularly a EMS. You know, I have a soft spot being a chief of EMS, uh, the EMTs and paramedics and, you know, officers that work for EMS, just truly incredible. And one of the things I remind them, because again, this, like any other profession, you lose focus sometimes of why. And when I see them, I see the, the thousands of people who get to have their loved ones with them for just a little longer because somebody in EMS said yes. Somebody in EMS decided to take a class. Somebody mustered up $400 to go into an EMT class to learn how to save a life and as a result has saved thousands. And it's not just the person you save. It's not just the person you treat. It's not just the person you transfer or transport. It's all their friends and family members and generations of people who get to love them for, for, for more time, right? And I think this connects back right. to the World Trade Center for me. Um, the extension of life, the, the ability to enjoy those people you love for just a little longer. And that comes off the backs and the hard work and the dedication and a commitment of EMS. And how could, how could I not sit back and say, how lucky am I to have had this career and to make the decision to end this career while I still have that level of joy, while I still love it as much as I do, while I still have the energy to do this for another five or 10 years, but then I would. <laughs> so I get to leave at a time when I'm still young. I can take whatever time's left for me before the 9-11 clock catches me, if God forbid, hopefully it never does, and spend it with my family and doing other things and, you know, enjoying EMS from afar 
and, you know, continuing to support them in the best way that I know, but to, to live a little, right? I want to live my life. Right. And, and I'm looking forward to it. I'm actually excited about it. I'm a little nervous. I'm not going to lie. Like this, first, I got to learn how to match all my own clothes because I've worn a uniform for the last 30 <laughs> plus years. You know, I already know which ones go together. So, you know, that's step number one is learn how to match my own clothes. Secondly is like, learn how to operate without having two cell phones on me at all times. So I'm sure that's a couple of weeks right there. <laughs> and then I'll figure out what I want to do after that. But I think there's lots of good things in my future. And I think the people that I'm leaving are perfectly capable and dedicated, amazing people who can take EMS in you know, the direction that they need to go and continue to support people. So I'm, I'm excited about it. Yeah, I am very excited about it. And I think there's good. some good stuff in our future. Well, it sounds like you've certainly left a strong base, um, which is important. And uh, I'm glad you're excited about retirement. I, I think um, FDNY is going to lose a great person, a uh, oh, great you. chief. But, uh, you know, I wish you and your family all the very best and, uh, and your friends. Just, you know, I, I agree. Just enjoy life. But uh, as I've said before, it's going to maybe take you some time. Give yourself maybe up to a year <laughs> before yeah. you get like, oh, well, this is what relaxing is really like. And I picked up my own clothes now and they can match. <laughs> <laughs> you need like adult oh. garanimals. You remember those garanimals? Mm -hmm. You need like adult yes. level garanimals. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. That's funny. Well, uh, I just want to thank you for being with us. Um, yes. Any for parting me. words for us? Well, I, I think I hope to see you sometime in the future. You know, maybe maybe uh, maybe I'll do a little speaking around the country and share some of these lessons. Um, I'm looking forward to that stuff. But my my number one piece of advice would be: don't let anybody tell you what you can and cannot do. And whatever that is, because we have this life to worry about right now, no matter what your beliefs are, whether there is another life someplace else, the one you have is the one that we're living right now. And you should make the most of that. Keep as positive as you can. Don't sweat those little things and don't let anybody tell you you can't achieve. And as much as we talked about some very difficult times along my career path, we really need young people to come into our profession and take this over and go out and continue the cycle of service. And I think, you know, we're, we're sliding a little where, you know, maybe folks are shying away from serving others. And I would highly encourage somebody who has even a, an iota of, uh, relation to me you know if you think you relate to me in some way whether you're a young woman or you're gay or whatever the case is or you're from the bronx i don't know you know whatever works for you i would i would encourage you to take a step forward and take a job of service like ems we need you we it doesn't happen on its own and us older people who've been around a long time are going to look to retire we need to be able to turn this over to, to dedicated, caring people who will continue our mission. So don't let the bad stories that we talk about make you think that's the only thing that's going on. There, there are really wonderful impacts that we have on people uh, and their generations. And thanks for having me. This was so much fun. I, I, I'm so glad that you joined us. And, and I do have to agree with you about the bad stories. You know, for the new people who are looking at this, you know, who may be in a big city and bad situation, you know, what a shining example you are and the good stories. You know, there's thousands of good stories for every bad story uh, and for people to understand that and want to make a difference. I, I think I think uh, you've really highlighted that today and I appreciate your being here. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you, everyone, and um, enjoy uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Uh -huh.